Jump Master Press presents Rogues and Warlocks, The King's Emerald, by R. Kyle Hanna. Read by Rick McVeigh. Printing and production copyright 2023 by Jump Master Press. Part 1. The Rogue. The howl of the lonely, no? The lone bay of a distant wolf echoed through the darkness. Gravel and rock crunched beneath the caravan's wheels as the four wagons traversed the desert night. Torches lit the rear corners of each wagon, holding the moonless darkness at bay. Clouds obscured the stars. A cool breeze stirred the dust. An answering howl, closer, split the night. The two lead horses stutter-stepped at the sound, but continued trudging forward. The wagons jerked with the motion, jarring a handful of sleeping passengers awake. A few rolled over, smacked their dry mouths, scratched their butts, and continued to sleep. Some shifted and yawned, eyes open in fear. Others sat up straight and stared into the surrounding darkness, sleep forgotten. Kara Minlock sat in the shadows of the third wagon, her back against the driver's bench, and watched the people around her with humor-filled eyes. No one looked at her. You still awake, little one? Kara looked over her shoulder and met the big brown eyes of the caravan boss. A scar, dimly visible in the torchlight, stretched from his left ear down his cheek like lightning on a clear night. Muscles rippled underneath his simple cotton shirt. He flashed her a dingy, disarming smile. I never sleep when traveling, she replied, her voice barely above a whisper. She nodded toward the other passengers. Too much to observe. Observe? (laughs) You're a voyeur, no? His belly laugh split the night startled the horses, and roused a few of the more uneasy sleepers. Angry eyes stared at him. He smiled and shrugged. The passengers lay back down. Many turned their backs to him. Scribe, she lied, and patted a small satchel at her belt. I observe and write what I see. And what do you see, little one? Kara smiled, despite her best efforts. She shifted, put her back to the wagon's wall, and faced the man without straining her neck. She had practiced and refined her persona dozens of times, and the lies rolled off her tongue without thinking. Well, I observed the hectic seaport full of burly men and cheap women. These wagons carry wheat, salt, and passengers, although the passengers were a late addition. Her eyes narrowed, and she lowered her voice. And I observed that you did not charge any of them a fee for the journey. The man's smile faltered for a moment, then grew to encompass his entire face. You do see everything, little one. Do. Go on. Most of these people, she kept her voice low and waved her hand around the wagon, have next to nothing, yet you give them a ride. Why? Kindness, little one, he replied. Life in this kingdom can be rough. Why not help those less fortunate, if you can? She smirked. That puts an awful burden on you and your men, doesn't it? Bandits, thieves, and rogues frequent this route, do they not? (laughs) Rogues? He laughed again. You are definitely a scribe to use that word. He produced a canteen from the floor near his feet and drank from the animal skin. He offered it to Kara, and she waved it off. He took another drink and returned it to its place. Tell me, little one, how did you become a scribe? It pays good, no? No, it doesn't, she replied with a shake of her head. But I was told at an early age that I had a gift, and it would be a crime not to use it. Yes, little one, we must use our gifts. You make this trek often, she asked, changing the subject. He offered a wry smile. Twice a week. Pick up supplies at Port Side and ferry them to Mid-City. Pick up people and supplies at Mid-City and carry them back to Port Side. Humor filled his eyes. Too boring for you, no? Maybe, she admitted. I have a question. (laughs) Scribes usually do, he said with a snicker. Why do they call it Mid-City? The caravan boss stifled another belly laugh, snorted instead, and put his hand over his mouth. He caught his breath. It is the midpoint between the capital and port side. Mid-City. They put a lot of thought into that, no? Kara grinned again. Thank you. That is very helpful for my next story. What about the rest of this kingdom? Rest of it? Where are you from, little one? A land across the sea, she replied. I came here to find new stories, legends, and tales to take back to my people. Hmm, 
He rubbed his chin, as if thinking about where to begin. Well, to the east are the Anur Mountains, and the Badlands beyond, a vast desert that no one has ever successfully crossed. No one? Legend says that anyone who's ventured more than a day into the desert has never returned. Excitement tinged his voice as he spoke. The queen, before her untimely death two years ago, sent a handful of expeditions. None returned. He lowered his voice. One body, badly mutilated, was found a few days after the last quest. The best minds in her court could not fathom the cause of death. After that, she stopped sending her bravest. Now only the foolhardy venture east. What do they call this desert? she asked, pointing to their surroundings. <laughs> this is not the desert, he laughed. This is simply the barrens, he pointed. Many miles east are the Anur Mountains. The wasteland is beyond. We are close enough you can see the Anur foothills in the daylight. Interesting, Kara replied. Go on. To the south is Portside, and to the north is the capital. Beyond that is sprawling farmland. He rubbed his hands together, and his voice took on a dreamy tone. My favorite is the western lands, large, clear lakes and mountains that stretch to heaven. It is the most gorgeous part of the entire kingdom. Sounds lovely, Kara admitted. I have not been there in many ages, he sadly said. Perhaps you should revisit. Perhaps I should, little one. The wind died, the animals grew quiet, and the eastern horizon grew purple. It will be sunup soon, the caravan boss stated. I must unfortunately end our pleasant conversation. Why? His smile grew, and he winked. Those rogues you mentioned attack at first light. I must turn my attention to the landscape to be ready. Of course. Thank you for passing the time with me. My pleasure, little one. The caravan boss faced forward. The driver, to his right, handed him the reins and picked up a crossbow. The man checked the weapon, faced out, and scanned the barren landscape. Kara stood behind him, stretched, and peered over his shoulder. Her joints loudly popped in the early dawn. Men now stood in each wagon, crossbows in hand, and swords sheathed at their waists. The passengers stirred, wiping the sleep from their bloodshot eyes. The women looked after the handful of children, while the men sat and grumbled about the uncomfortable wood floor of the wagons. The first fingers of light filled the eastern sky, and Kara saw the foothills of the Anair Mountains. The silhouettes of trees and rocky ridges took shape. Orange and purple fingers split the heavens and gave the world a murky hue. A fine mist drifted from the jungle canopy miles away. A shout split the dawn. A man in the wagon behind Kara clutched his chest and toppled over the side. He rolled twice, snapping the arrow protruding from his chest. More arrows sliced through the air, most missing their targets high. A few impacted the wagons. No one else fell to the initial volley. Right side! The caravan boss yelled. His booming bass cut the morning. The man snapped the reins and spurred the pair of horses faster. Kara dropped to safety, her back to the attacker's side of the wagon. The caravan boss yelled a warning as a second barrage smacked into the side of the wagon. She felt a trio of impacts into the wood to her back. A jagged arrow punched through the wagon to her left side. She stared at the arrowhead in amusement. A horse yelped in pain, and her wagon slowed. Battle cries grew with the dawn. The lead wagon and the second continued on, their horses nearing a full gallop. Dust filled the air as their hooves pounded the dirt road. Kara peeked over the side and counted nearly a dozen shadows attacking the wagon train. The caravan boss leapt from the seat, drew his sword, and met the marauders thirty yards from the wagon. Other men followed, despite being outnumbered. Women and children screamed in fear. A wry smile curled Kara's lips. Don't get involved. Images of earlier confrontations flitted through her mind. Most ended well, but a few left her with scars. I always get hurt when I stick my nose in. Not this time. She swapped sides of the wagon to observe the melee. The caravan boss dispatched an attacker with the thrust of his sword. He withdrew, spun, and diagonally sliced a second. One of his men fell, a crossbow bolt protruding from his chest. More marauders advanced. No! A woman's scream ripped through the cacophony of the battle. Kara sat up and looked at the rear wagon. A pair of bandits fought off a trio of women. 
a young girl in a bandit's grasp. The girl, not quite a teen, flailed her arms and legs, kicking, punching, and scratching. The two men laughed and overpowered the women. An ugly, scarred face appeared at the wagon's edge. Wide, hungry eyes searched the wagon and locked onto her. The bandit lasciviously licked his lips. He climbed into the wagon. Damn, Kara sighed. His rough hands grabbed her. She punched the man in the face. He staggered back in the unstable wagon and waved his arms to maintain balance. She punched him in the groin. He cried and doubled over. Kara kicked him out of the wagon. He fell in a heap in a halo of dust. So much for not getting involved. She jumped down and ran toward the last wagon. Her eyes locked onto the pair abducting the young girl. She drew a pair of daggers from beneath her tunic as she ran, planted her foot on a wagon wheel, and launched herself into the air. One of the men looked up, eyes wide in shock, and a fleeting sense of satisfaction touched her soul. She planted her feet into his chest and drove him to the ground. Ribs crunched. Kara rolled from the bandit, whirled, and charged his friend. The man released the girl and turned in time to take both daggers in the chest. His eyes widened in surprise. Spittle formed on his lips. He quietly collapsed without a word. She pulled her blades from him, quickly glanced at the terrified women, turned, and charged toward the main battle. A trio of bodies lay at the feet of the caravan boss. He stood back to back with the last two of his wagoneers and faced twice their number. He waved his sword, keeping the attackers at bay. One of the men fell back, dropped his sword, and armed a crossbow. He raised the weapon at the caravan boss. Kara kicked the crossbow high, and the bolt screamed into the sky. The bandit awkwardly swung the bow at her. She ducked the attack and slipped inside his charge. Her blades blurred as they repeatedly struck the man. He screamed in pain, the sound morphing into a spittle-filled death rattle. She counted six strikes before she turned and headed for the next closest bandit. The bowman fell over, eyes wide in shock. Kara ducked a lunge, slid under the sword slash, and sliced the man's ankles. The rocky ground cut through her knees, and she used the pain to push her blades forward. The razor-sharp daggers penetrated the man's flimsy leather armor and broke skin. The man wobbled a moment and collapsed. He grabbed his legs and rolled on the ground in agony. Kara hopped to her feet. The caravan boss dispatched his opponent with a slash from his longsword. The remaining bandits ran. Let them go, he ordered his men. He faced the retreating bandits and bellowed, Next time I will not be so forgiving! An eerie quiet settled on the barrens. The sun broke over the Anner Mountains and bathed them in light. The wounded horse whinnied in pain. The others nervously tromped. The coppery smell of blood filled the air. Wails of anguish cut the morning, drowning out fearful sobs. Kara moved back to the wagon and leaned her back onto the wood, while the surviving wagoneers systematically ensured the bandits were dead. Crimson stained their swords. The caravan boss pulled a pair of crossbow bolts from the wagon and heavily thumped against the wood next to her. He rubbed his whiskered face in his hands and stared at the carnage before him. Where did you learn to fight like that, little one? I have four older brothers, she replied. You attacked your brothers like that? No, she smirked. They usually got worse. The pair laughed. The sound, a stark contrast to the weeping women in the last wagon. Your men in the other wagons, they did not come back for you. No, little one, they did not, he agreed. His face scrunched in thought. What is your name? Kara. I am Jacob, the caravan master. They shook hands. Would you like a job, Kara? I could use someone who is loyal that I can depend on. You think that is me? She asked, touching her chest. You don't even know me. I know you are a fighter, he gestured toward the last wagon. I know you do what is necessary to protect people. That is enough, no? Thank you, but I must decline. I have business in Mid-City that cannot wait. Disappointment clouded his face. If you ever change your mind, I know where to find you. He nodded, and the pair sat in silence. The men of the caravan finished their grisly business and moved to check the women in the last wagon. Weeping and moans drifted across the prairie. One favor? he asked, breaking the silence. Yes, Jacob? Help us clean up this mess. 
The sun had traveled halfway to its zenith before the two wagons arrived at their destination. The golden orb burned the clouds away and beat down on the weary travelers. Sweat and tears drifted down their faces, mixing with the dirt and dust from the journey. A cluster of guards in bright orange tabards crowded around the two wagons as they rolled to a stop outside the high walls of Mid-City. Three stood back, armed with crossbows, while two approached the lead wagon. Two more stood off to the side, hands on the hilts of their swords, and watched the caravan boss secure the reins. "'What do we have here?' the first guard asked. He wore sandals, the standard tabard, and a helmet with bright yellow plumage. He snarled the words, contempt in his voice. "'Travelers from Portside,' Jacob replied. He motioned over his shoulder. "'We were attacked at dawn. Three of our party are dead.' A chorus of sobs from the rear wagon punctuated the statement. "'We had a report earlier of an attack,' the man stated, rubbing his chin. Two other wagons arrived a few hours ago.' "'Yes,' Jacob scowled. "'I will be dealing with them shortly.' The guard frowned. There will be no violence in my city, understand? Jacob touched his chest, and a look of shocked innocence slid over his face. I made no mention of violence, good sir, only that I will deal with them. Kara, sitting behind the caravan leader, giggled. Something funny, girl? The guard turned his attention to her. Manly banter always makes me laugh, she replied with a shrug. The guard scoffed ignored the quip, and turned his attention back to Jacob. Cargo? Wheat and salt, Jacob answered. He pointed. And a few passengers. The guards performed a lazy search of the wagons. They paused an extra minute at the three bodies in the wagon beside Kara. She sat quietly and watched them inspect the corpses. One of the men blanched and turned away. Another ran off and heaved. His friends laughed. And your attackers, which way did they run? The guard asked, bored. The survivors headed toward the Anir Mountains. The rest are lying in the barrens, feeding the wildlife. The guard's expression morphed into shock. His eyes widened and he gulped twice. Feeding the what? Kara suppressed a smile but said nothing. You may want to tell me what happened, the guard stated. Jacob complied and told the story agreed upon by the men. They repelled an attack from bandits. No one wanted to admit that the small-framed Kara, a scribe, outfought a handful of burly marauders. Jacob told of the heroics of his men, and that the bravest died saving the rest. Hmm, the guard said, rubbing his chin. He nodded his head, apparently satisfied with the story. To the north of the castle square you'll find the undertaker. Tell him Guard Nex sent you, and he'll give you a fair price. Thank you, Guard Nex. Now move it along. You're backing up traffic. Jacob snapped the reins, and the wagons moved through the gate and into Mid-City. He handed control to his driver and turned in his seat. The towering walls embraced Kara as the wagon bumped along the rocky trail. Mid-City is a fabulous place, no? So far, she agreed. This is the midpoint between the capital and the sea. You told me that already. It is also the midpoint between the Badlands to the east, he pointed, and the Highlands, he pointed in the other direction. This is the trading hub of the entire Zenar kingdom. Almost all trade comes through this city. That is interesting, she admitted. She stared at the buildings and the architecture as they rolled by, committing routes to memory. Narrow, dark alleys, despite the nearer noonday sun, crisscrossed the city. Single-story, flat-roof buildings dominated the landscape. Smoke lazily drifted from several chimneys, despite the late spring warmth. The buildings gradually grew in size and elegance until they neared the walls of Ovu Glen, the king's castle in Mid-City. Ovu Glen towered above the town, its trio of towers reaching toward the clear sky. Orange and green flags along the ramparts flapped in the breeze. Dozens of guards patrolled the parapets. There are a lot of guards, she commented. Do they guard the castle like that, without the king present? She shook her head. I'd hate to see the roster if he was here. He is here, Jacob replied. Or at least he will be by nightfall. He comes here every few months to make an appearance and collect the taxes. 
He likes to ensure everything is done properly. The last dripped with sarcasm. The wagons rolled to a stop beside the identical pair that left them behind hours earlier. All four parked in front of the livery to the west of the city center and Oview Glen. I must bid you farewell, little one, Jacob stated. He hopped from the wagon, lightly landed, and scanned the livery. I believe I have business to attend to. Kara dropped from the wagon beside him. They shook hands. I can honestly say that it was not a boring trip. Now you have something to write about, scribe. He arched an eyebrow and leaned closer, a sly smile on his face. Now, if you ever wish to give up your dubious career, come find me. You would be a welcome addition to my caravan. Dubious career? You doubt my ability to tell a tale? I doubt that you are a scribe. I have no doubt that you can tell a story. The two laughed, shook hands again, and Kara left the livery behind. She wandered the city until dark, familiarizing herself with routes, alleys, dead ends, and guard posts. She stopped two boys lighting street torches and asked for the nearest hotel. She followed their directions, found the diamond in the rough, and entered. A night's rest rejuvenated her after two days in the wagon. She removed the makeshift bar on the door, a heavy shiffer robe she placed in front of the entrance, and made her way downstairs. The scuffed wooden stairs creaked and groaned under her weight. The worn handrail left a splinter in her hand. She silently cursed and sucked on her finger as she entered the main floor restaurant. A handful of patrons sat at the small round tables that filled the main floor of the hotel. A fat man in a sodden tunic stood behind the bar that ran along the far wall. A haggard server, her corset cut above her knees, moved from table to table. One man reached out and rubbed her leg when she walked by. He received a face full of water for his efforts. The two men with him laughed. Kara took a seat near the door, away from the others, ordered breakfast, and observed. An elderly woman sat alone on the far side of the room. Smoke gently wafted from her pipe as she scribbled something on parchment. She blew a smoke ring, dabbed her quill in a well on the table, and continued her laborious writing. A loud pop drew her attention back to the three men at the table and the red-faced server. She towered over the man that touched her earlier, her hand cocked back, ready to strike. Wide eyes stared up at her as he held the left side of his face. Woman, he snarled, rising from his seat. He grabbed her nearest arm. If you ever lay a hand on me again, I'll... The door opened, and Jacob the caravan boss strolled in. He stopped, backlit against the early morning sun, and put his hands on his hips. The door banged shut, cut off the light, and returned the restaurant to its normal gloom. The three men at the table stared. Release her, Jacob ordered. The man's hand immediately opened. The server ran behind the bar, tears in her eyes. I believe we have business to discuss, no? Ain't no business, the man replied, sitting down. We thought you was dead. He scratched his mangy head. You left us for dead. Survival, one of the men's friends added. You got cut off. We chose to live. All in the past, Jacob stated, dismissing the conversation with a wave. He walked a few feet, stopped short of their table, and spread his arms wide. And all is forgiven. The three men sighed in relief. Smiles lit their faces. As soon as you pay me for the goods, the wagons, and the horses. The smiles vanished. What? what? You heard me, the caravan boss stated. Kara slowly pulled a pair of throwing knives from a scabbard beneath her tunic. We ain't got no money, the second man said. I know the wagons are at the livery. Where are the horses, the goods from Portside? Jacob clenched his fists. His knuckles popped, echoing in the suddenly quiet hotel and restaurant. The first man stood and faced the caravan boss. Gone. We sold them to pay for the hotel. His friends nodded. Jacob stared at each in turn. His fierce eyes bore into each man's soul. Consider it severance. And so you know, I've already talked with the other caravan masters, the ones to Portside, the Capitol, and Kerma. You are banned from working the wagons again. You can't do that! It's done. No one will hire you, Jacob concluded. You are 
he smiled. Unreliable. We thought you was dead. You thought wrong, no? He turned to leave, spotted Kara, and nodded. Enjoying our fair city, little one? Kara smiled. It's definitely entertaining. And what do you have planned for the day, little one? Kara stood, made a show of sheathing the knives, and met Jacob near the door. I was going to have breakfast, but I think I'll skip it now. She glanced behind her. The men stared at her with wide eyes. I don't like the company. The two walked outside. Jacob stretched and released the tension from his neck and shoulders. Kara sniffed the air. The aroma of cooking meat made her regret her decision to eat breakfast. Jacob led her to a nearby alley, looked both ways, and lowered his head. Little one, Kara, I wanted to thank you again for your assistance in the barrens. He jerked his head toward the diamond. Those fools left us to die, and we would have if not for you. So I want to give you some advice. She arched an eyebrow but remained quiet. I think I know who and what you are, he said in a whisper. If I'm right, you have big plans in Mid-City. The king's guards do not play and will be more aggressive with him here. Do be careful, little one. Kara smiled. What do you think I am? I always enjoy this part. You are a thief, no? Do not deny it, little one. I saw the way you fought those bandits. I've seen it only twice before. Both of them were thieves, rogues. The edges of her mouth twitched in a smile. And what happened to them? Jacob looked up and down the street again. They both died. Horribly. Kara left Jacob outside the diamond, found a different restaurant, and had a quiet breakfast overlooking the market square. She watched the vendors set up their booths and wares in fascination, impressed with the well-rehearsed choreography of controlled chaos. A bell at the castle struck nine times, and a flood of people poured into the square. Voices rose as haggling began. Kara sipped a strong brewed drink and soaked in the spectacle. She spent the next couple of hours exploring the city and grew self-conscious with each passing minute. Passers-by, vendors, and citizens stared at her, and she realized her drab, dark clothes did not fit in with the colored fabrics of Mid-City. The first rule of being a rogue? Blend in. She entered the market and bought a colorful tunic from a kind-looking, wrinkled old woman. Kara paid in gold, and the woman's face lit up. She turned to show her good fortune to the next vendor over, and Kara quickly stuffed a matching skirt into her bag. The practice move was so fast, no one noticed. Kara nodded to the woman and disappeared into the crowd. She changed in an alley, emerged into the bright morning sun, and moved freely among the citizens. The only glances that came her way were from young men with lust in their eyes and big burly men seeking an easy target. She noted them, but ignored them. They posed no threat. She returned to the market and filled her pack with fruit, smoked steak, and skins of water. The sun beat down, promising a hot day of exploration. Kara, the morning sun at her back, moved toward the city center where the buildings grew in height and opulence. The drab single-story structures gave way to multi-story homes. Balconies, flying flags, and banners overlooked the main road to the castle. Elegantly carved planter boxes, most with colorful flowers, sat beneath open second-story windows. She noted servants, dressed in black and white, cleaning the windows and tending the plants. She sadly shook her head and moved with the crowd toward the castle. I could never live like that. Colorfully clad syncophants, most with large gaudy hats, blended with black and white dressed servants in a long line streaming toward the king's fourth home, Oviglen. Orange tabard wearing guards stoically watched everyone. Crossbow armed knights patrolled the ramparts above. Move along, a gruff voice ordered. A tabard-wearing guard, his helmet sporting bright yellow plumage, pushed the servants toward the gate. It was the same guard that greeted Kara at the city gate the day before. Nex. You're already late. Hurry up. Didn't you hear the bell? Damn deaf peasants. He shoved an older woman. She shuffled forward two steps and fell in a cloud of dust. The guards laughed as two other servants helped the woman to her feet. Dust yourself off before you enter the castle, Nex sneered. He turned toward a man dressed in a dull yellow tunic and flowing orange cape. The guard's demeanor instantly changed. 
A respectful grin filled his face, and his voice held a tone of respect. Citizen Marlowe, good to see you again, sir. Marlowe, a portly man with oversized jowls, two chins, and elephant-like ears, covered his nose and mouth with a yellow handkerchief. I am well, God next, he coughed, except <coughs> for all the crowds on the road today. His Majesty is due in tonight, Nix explained. We had to conscript extra help to ensure every room is clean, he shook his head. I think they are dragging in more dirt than they are cleaning. Morlo nodded his agreement. You may be right. Is Duke Salon in today? Yes. Good. I have business to discuss with him, he frowned. If I can ever get in. Nex took the hint. Move, he bellowed. Make way for Citizen Morlo. The crowd parted. Those not fast enough were shoved out of the way by the guards. Morlo, head high and nose higher, strolled past without a glance. All right, back in line, let's go, Nex ordered. The crowd resumed their slow shuffle through the checkpoint. The guards checked every bag and satchel and confiscated every dagger, sword, and weapon. A pile of discarded blades lay in the dirt next to the gate. Kara turned and walked away. I'm not getting in that way. She glanced at the rising sun and made her way around the outer castle wall. She completed a circuit around the castle square in mid-city and found only one other entrance, heavily guarded and inaccessible to the citizenry. She headed back toward the market, a smirk on her face. There is always another way. I just have to find it. She glanced at the late morning sun. Let's try something else in the meantime. She found an alley a few blocks from the market and easily scaled the wooden wall of a small house. She gingerly tested the roof, found it solid, and crouched to view the city. The city was laid out in concentric circles, with the castle set in the center. The affluent maintained the next two circles, followed by the single-story worker-class homes, and finally, along the outer walls of Mid-City, sat the tarps and lean-tos of the poor and destitute. Kara sighed. It's the same everywhere, with just a few variations. She traveled along the roof, jumped to the next building with little effort, and did it again. No one yelled at her. No one even looked up. She made her way across half the city without a slip or putting her foot through a roof. She crouched near the market square and caught her breath. She glanced up at the sun as it made its way to its midday zenith, looked at the alley below her, and calculated the timing. She silently slid off the edge, hung from the building for a heartbeat, and let go. Kara dropped from the single-story structure into the shadows of the alley near the center of Mid-City. She landed, knees bent, without a sound. Her new vantage, deep in shadow, gave her a grand view of the market square bustling with people. The morning sun crept higher into the clear sky, slowly dissolving her shadowy hiding spot. She glanced over her shoulder and watched the daylight slowly slide down the wall to her right. She smiled and retreated down the alley away from the market as the sun dissolved the alley's shadow. She left the narrow corridor and blended with the pedestrians a block from the square. She strolled a block, turned, and retraced her steps. The sun passed directly overhead and started its long trek toward the western horizon. The alley again filled with dark shadow. The entire event took twelve minutes. Kara smiled. Twelve minutes at midday is the only time I can't hide. I could grow to like this town, she shrugged. Too bad, I'll be gone in a day or two. She scaled the building and, using the rooftops, headed back toward the city center. She stayed low, leapt over alleys, and stopped when the single-story buildings gave way to the larger, more affluent homes. Kara checked her surroundings and decided to risk it. She ran, jumped an alley, grabbed a planter box on the larger building, and quickly scaled the two-story home. She crouched, gulped in air, and listened for alarms. She heard no shouts, no warnings, no questions. She peeked over the edge of the roof. The city below carried on without a care. She proceeded, roof by roof, to a rare three-story house that overlooked the castle's main gate. She scaled that wall in the same manner, Thankful, the planter boxes were sturdily built, and crouched behind a small shed on the roof, she deftly picked the lock and opened the door a crack. A stairwell descended into darkness. She closed the door. 
The afternoon sun beat down, and she wiped the sweat from her forehead. She slowly panned her head and studied the roof, looking for a way into the castle. She frowned. Clotheslines filled the roof, preventing a running start. The castle walls sat a block away, higher than the roof she occupied. Even if I could run, I can't jump that distance. She scanned the ramparts from her new vantage and froze. A guard stared directly at her. She crouched in the shadow of the shed, but that put her on the castle side of the hidden stairwell. A smile curled her lips. He can't see me in my black tune. Damn. She remembered she wore the bright colors of Mid-City. The guard leaned forward off the rampart, eyes squinted, and stared at her shadowy hiding place. Kara held her breath. Her heart pounded. The guard finally shrugged and turned away. She slipped around to the back of the shed and let out her breath. A quick glance told her the guard continued his rounds. Kara slipped from the roof and returned to her original spot overlooking the market. She dropped into the alley and put her back against the wall. That was a bust, she muttered. There has to be a way in. A boot scraped a rock to her left. She drew a throwing knife and held it to her side. Who's there? A small statured man with unkempt hair slipped from the shadows and approached. He wore baggy clothes and a sheathed dagger around his waist. He stopped ten feet away and showed his empty hands. My name is Clem. I'm not a threat to you, young thief, he smiled. I've been watching you. You remind me of me in my prime. What do you want? Just curious. What do you hope to accomplish running around the roofs of Mid-City? He leaned against the wall and crossed his arms. Kara remained silent. As I suspected, Clem stated, you are looking for a way into the castle. That is a tough task, especially with the king's eminent arrival. He paused as a pair of gaudily attired vendors stopped at the mouth of the alley. They quietly haggled over something, exchanged packages, and went their separate ways. Clem moved a few feet closer. I can help. Kara perked up. She raised an eyebrow, but said nothing. I represent a certain fringe element in Mid-City. We are always on the lookout for young talent, and I believe you could be that talent. A thieves' guild? Kara spoke for the first time. She shook her head. I work alone. Yes, that I already calculated. My proposal is not so much a recruitment but more of a fee for service. And what are you offering? Information. A way into the castle? Clem shook his head. No, my information is about a man. A man that can lead you to a secret escape tunnel. She rolled her eyes. You know a man who knows a secret entrance. I'm not a fool, old man. He is one of the king's trusted lieutenants named Jokal, Clem explained. He edged another foot closer. For a fee... I will point him out to you. He nodded toward the market. He is there now. You follow him. You'll find your way into the castle. Caution chilled her spine. She did not easily trust. Why don't you and your guild simply follow him and take your fill from the castle? A few have tried, Clem admitted. They now rot in the dungeon. But you want to help me. For a fee. How much? Clem rubbed his chin. Ten coins? Five she countered, and five more if your information is accurate. The old man licked his lips. Done! A word of caution, old man. If this is a trick, if this is a con, your death will be painful. His eyes widened, and he audibly gulped. You are more than a thief. Much more. He glanced down the alley toward the market. He pointed. That man, in scarlet. Kara followed his gaze and saw a thin, wiry man in a red tunic picking through fruit on a cart. The man picked an apple, flipped a coin to the vendor, and strolled away. She turned her attention back to Clem. The old man had moved another foot closer. She flicked her wrist and lodged a knife into the wall near his head. Close enough? He gulped again and backed away two steps. Anything else I should know? Clem licked his lips. The vault is in the southwest tower, halfway to the top. At least that's what I was told. I know for sure that the king's emerald arrived yesterday, under heavy guard. She rose, retrieved her knife, and dropped five small coins into his hands. Meet me here tomorrow at this time. If your information is correct, I'll give you the rest. If it's not, you'll save me the trouble of tracking you down. 
Do we have an understanding? Clem nodded. Go. The old man scurried away. Kara left the alley, found her mark, and followed him away from the market. He turned back a few times, and she quickly blended into the citizens. He trailed around, backtracked, and headed back to the market. Kara smirked. He's good, but I'm better. She entered another alley and scaled the wall. The lieutenant continued his circuitous route through the city, backtracking and checking for a tail. He never looked up. Kara followed him through the rings of single-story houses to the outskirts of the city. He stopped before a small, dilapidated building that heavily leaned to one side, scanned his surroundings, entered, and shut the door behind him. Kara stayed on the roof with a good view of the ramshackle wooden building. It was small, barely bigger than one of the outhouses that lined the market square. The sun made its way toward the western horizon, and the man did not emerge. Long shadows spread across the landscape, and a welcoming breeze cooled the city. The noise from the market died. The sun set. Flickering flames from torches lining the streets added to the starlight. She changed into her dark clothes, checked for onlookers, and dropped from the roof. She blended with the shadows, nearly invisible, and made her way to the shed. Cracks in the wood offered her a look inside. It was empty. She slipped inside. The dirt floor revealed a small metal grate in a corner. A smile tugged her lips. The old man was right. Worth the five coins. Kara had no intention of returning to pay him the rest. She slowly lifted the metal gate and dropped into darkness. Kara followed a curving stone corridor, lit every twenty feet by torches on the wall. Cobwebs hung from the ceiling and filled every corner along the dirt floor walkway. She silently hugged the wall and followed the path. She calculated the distance from the wall to the castle and knew she had a long walk ahead of her. She relished the thought. The day among the people had mentally drained her, even though she spent half of it traversing roofs. She preferred the solitary life of a rogue and could not wait to get out of mid-city. The dark, damp tunnel recharged her and she pushed forward. The dirt floor morphed to rock and she found herself totally encased in layered stone. The torches were placed every ten feet. Their flickering shadows competed with each other and created an ever-changing ripple of light. Voices echoed through the stone passage, and she stopped. Footsteps receded. Kara crept forward and eased around a bend in the tunnel. The stone walls branched into a T-intersection. Shadows from torches slowly retreated down the right-hand trail. A single guard stood at the intersection, staring down that branch. Don't forget my dinner, Flynn, he called. Yeah, yeah, echoed the reply. The guard kicked at the wall. He never remem- Kara's knife caught him right behind the ear, hilt first. The steel blade clattered to the floor as the guard's eyes rolled in his head. He collapsed in a heap of cheap armor. She rushed forward, checked his pulse, nodded, retrieved her blade, and dragged him back down the corridor. Mel? the retreating voice inquired. Footsteps approached. An armored man with the chevrons of a sergeant rounded the corner. His eyes widened, and he reached for his sword. Kara's knife hilt hit him on the bridge of the nose. He released his sword and grabbed his face. He cried in agony and staggered a step. He turned away from the intersection. Kara's second dagger hit him behind the ear, just like Mel. Flynn landed in a pile of skin and steel. Blood rolled down his busted nose and puddled on the floor. His steady, even breath blew the dust away from his face. She retrieved her weapons, sheathed them, and stood with her hands on her hips. She shook her head. A less than auspicious beginning, but, she smiled, no one's dead, yet. She dragged both men down the corner and around the bend in the stone corridor. Sweat rolled down her face, and her muscles ached. She stretched, wiped her brow, and proceeded down the tunnel to the right. A set of stairs wound up in a tight circle. Kara paused, listened, heard nothing, and headed up. She breathed a relieved sigh when she made it to a massive wooden door without running into a guard heading down. She did not want to have a fight in the enclosed stairwell. The door sat open, spilling light down the stairs, and she cautiously approached. 
She peeked around the door and found an empty corridor, save for majestic tapestries hanging from the ceiling and bronze busts spaced between them. She glanced at everything, thought the tapestries might fetch a good price in another land, and quickly dismissed the idea. She had other, smaller items in mind. Kara glided down the passage. She ducked into an alcove to avoid a pair of squires so involved in their conversation they did not even notice the flutter of the tapestry. She let them pass, stepped out, and immediately back when two others rounded the corner. It's steak kebab tonight, one stated. Again, his companion grumbled. That's three nights this week. At least we are eating, the first one stated. I heard that the second phalanx lost their rations for two days because they... They drifted out of earshot. Kara counted to five, made sure no one else traveled the passage, and slipped from her hiding place. She dashed up a set of stairs, crossed another T intersection, and proceeded across an empty banquet hall. Decorations of orange and red adorned the room. Place settings, for more than fifty, filled long wooden tables. A dais with the king's opulent throne and twelve place settings, six on each side, dominated the far side of the room. A door near the throne creaked open. Kara disappeared behind a column so fast that it looked like she vanished into thin air. A trio of servants entered the banquet hall. They laid goblets at each plate, adjusted the silverware, and generally ensured everything was in its proper place. The king will arrive within the hour, an older woman cried out. She toppled a goblet, righted it, and continued down the line straightening. His subjects will arrive immediately after. We do not have enough time. We have plenty of time, a younger woman rebutted. The two favored with small noses, blue eyes, and dirty blonde hair. You never work one of the king's feast, the older woman spat. She stopped working, hands on her hips, and stared at her younger version. Everything must be perfect. The young woman tried to fight the smile on her face and failed. Then don't you think we should get back to work? The older woman jumped like she had been whipped and scrambled down the line. Ten minutes later, she ushered her two helpers through the door they entered. Kara scooted through the banquet hall and out a door opposite their exit. She traversed another stone corridor, rounded a corner, and froze. A guard sat in a chair outside a door. His gentle snores filled the passage. Her eyes fell on the pair of dogs at his feet. Both animals looked up from their slumber. Low, menacing growls filled the air. The guard stirred. Groggy brown eyes slowly focused on her. What? Kara drew a dagger and underhanded it at the man. It smacked him squarely between the eyes. He toppled backward and fell on his back. His head smacked the stone with a sickening wet thud. He did not move. The dogs leapt to their feet. Kara followed through with her throw, snatched the smoked meat from her satchel, and tossed the pieces to the dogs. Their growls immediately ceased. The animals tore into the meat, devouring the tasty, impromptu meal. Tails wagged. She eased forward, let them sniff her hand, and petted their heads. There is more where that came from, she whispered. She picked up her dagger and checked on the guard. She nodded. Satisfied he was alive, but would wake with a terrible headache. Keep the way clear for me and you'll get it, okay? The dogs licked her face. This should keep you occupied a while. She tossed two more pieces of meat, complete with bones, and continued down the corridor. She had to be getting close to her destination. That thought flooded her system with adrenaline, and she pushed forward. She traveled up another stone staircase and stopped near the top. Trumpets blared, announcing the arrival of the king. Knights in clanking armor ran through the castle floors below her. Musicians struck a lively tune. The music echoed through the stone walls. Kara dropped to her knees, and, her head barely above the last step of the stairs, glanced around the corner. Two guards stood outside her destination. The castle vault. The men stared out a murder hole in the wall, their attention on the festivities below. She charged. The men turned toward her footsteps, and the closest, a burly man with red hair and beard, took a front kick to his armored chest. The impact knocked him into his skinny companion, and both sprawled on the floor. Carol waited, let the first one clamber to his feet, and kicked him again. He fell back onto his smaller companion, squashing him against the stone. Damn it, girl! Red cried and got to his feet again. She hurled a bolo at his legs. 
He stumbled, tripped, and fell on his face. His head bounced off the stone. He groaned and lifted his head. Foggy eyes stared at her before they rolled back in his head. He collapsed. His partner lay beside him unconscious. That was easier than I thought it would be, she smirked. She retrieved her bolo, wound it, and put it back in its place on her waist. She glanced out the hole in the wall and got her bearings. She calculated she stood halfway up one of the three castle spires, just as the old thief had said. The city lay before her. Bright lights and music gave Mid-City a festive feel. The opulent traveled by coach or walked toward the castle gate to her left. Those not invited to the banquet danced in the streets to the music. She turned away from the street party and walked to the vault. Two large double doors blocked her path. Four steel locks kept her from her prize. A smirk tugged her lips. Piece of cake. Twenty minutes later, she tugged the double doors open and smiled. Part Two The Warlock Get up! Get up! Grendel Tempest rolled over, pulled the pillow over his head, and tried to shut out the noise outside his door. Running footfalls, clanking armor, and alarmed shouts disrupted his much-needed slumber. Two days on a wagon train, attending the king's every fanciful thought, followed by a drunken banquet, left him exhausted. The 36-year-old sorcerer had been in the king's employ for less than a year and, after several trips to the kingdom, contemplated a change in careers. The king's descent into fantastic wishes, love potions, transmogrify lead to gold, destroy his enemies from afar, left Grendel desiring a quieter life. The urgent banging at his door reinforced that desire. Wake up, sorcerer! Someone shouted. We are under attack! Grendel sat up and rubbed his eyes. Attack? Here? In mid-city? Preposterous! What are you babbling about, you fool? The door flew open, and a trio of guards entered. Their wide eyes belied their panic and frustration. Each held a sword in his hand and huffed for breath. The lead guard, wearing bright orange plumage on his helmet and a scarlet tunic, looked at him and snarled. Get up, sorcerer! The king demands your presence! Grendel tossed the heavy wool blanket aside and slipped off the bed. The cool air chilled him and sent goosebumps down his arms. He shivered. What is it? You said we're under attack. A number of guards are dead, he stated, a tinge of fear in his voice. Someone is in the castle. The king demands your presence now. Patience, Grendel replied, pulling on his pants. The dead are not going anywhere, and I'm sure the usurpers have long since departed. He slipped a tunic over his head, followed by a thick sweater. His body instantly warmed, and sweat beaded his face. He let out a sigh and removed the sweater, replacing it with a long flowing cape. Satisfied he could stay comfortable, he donned his boots and faced the guard. I'm ready. What is your name? Jokal. I'm ready, guard Jokal. Lead the way. The guard exited Grendel's quarters and turned left. Grendel followed, with the other two guards trailing behind. Frenzied men, Knights, squires, and servants ran through the dark, dank corridors. Something flashed in Grendel's periphery. He slowed, skipped a step, and looked down a side passage. He saw nothing but a gently wafting tapestry. One of the guards pushed him forward. The quartet descended a set of stairs and entered the long stone passageway that led to the banquet hall. The smell of the feast from the night before lingered in the air, and Grendel's stomach growled. Two guards stood before the double doors to the hall. They turned and pushed the heavy oak open. The sweet aroma of wine and the pungent stench of vomit ended Grendel's appetite. Ah, good, my warlock. The king sat on his throne in the center of a dais that spanned the entire wall. Crumbs of bread and bits of meat lay atop his round belly, remnants of the feast hours earlier. The forty-two-year-old king wore the traditional orange of his ancestors, a ghastly contrast to the drab stone of the hall. The color highlighted his bloodshot eyes. He grabbed a goblet and drained it in one gulp. He slightly swayed in his seat. He hasn't moved since the banquet, mused Grendel. He's still drunk. No wonder he looks ancient. He bowed. You summoned me, sire? 
The king waved the goblet, and a servant girl appeared at his side as if Grendel had conjured her. She poured it full of wine and disappeared in the wink of an eye. King Zuron took a drink, licked his lips, and dreamily smiled. He's still drunk. This should be entertaining. Grendel, my warlock, we have been invaded. I hate it when he calls me warlock. I'm a sorcerer, not some witch. My castle breached by inter... He belched. Interlopers. He swayed in his seat, almost spilling his wine. So, Cal? Yes, my liege. Zoran took another drink, and his words slurred. Find the bastards that infil... infil... infiltrated my castle. Hang them, or you will hang. He slurped his goblet and slid down on the throne, a satisfied smile on his face. His eyes closed, and the goblet slipped from his fingers. The red wine drenched his pants before the copper cup clattered across the stone floor. A light snore slipped from his lips. Come on, sorcerer, Jokal said, grabbing him by the arm. We need to find out who got in and how. Grendel jerked his arm free. Where do we begin? He stared at the guard with his best... I will not be manhandled, stare. Jokal did not look impressed. He snarled. Follow me! The guard led the quartet back through the stone passages of the castle. Servants now lined the walls, waiting to be interrogated by Jokal's guards. Many women, barely dressed in the early hours, stood in tears. The men, shivering in their bedclothes, scowled at the rough treatment. He paused by a younger man, wearing yellow plumage. Next? Sir? Guard Nex replied. He snapped to attention. His boots clinked together. The other nearby guards followed his example. Begin the interrogation. I want everyone questioned. No one leaves this castle until I have answers. It shall be done. Jokal nodded and led Grendel and his escorts down through the belly of the castle. The further they descended, the cooler and danker it grew. Moisture hung heavy in the air. Torches flickered as they passed, their warmth fleeting and barely noticeable. Grendel shivered, and his stomach growled again. Jokal glanced his way and snarled. If you're that hungry, conjure us some breakfast, the guard to his left murmured. His companion laughed. A quick glance from Jokal silenced their laughter. They arrived at a T intersection and stopped. Two guards, one with a bandage on his nose, sat on the rough floor, surrounded by six others. They saw Jokal, jumped to their feet, and slightly bowed. I was told you were dead, Flynn, Jokal stated, his head cocked to the left. They'll soon wish they were, one of the men guarding them whispered. A curt look from Jokal silenced further comment. Attack, sir, Flynn replied. They are fast. Took Mel and me out in seconds. Did you get a good look at them? Jokal asked. How many are we dealing with? I saw one, maybe two, but there had to be others. They took us out without a sound, Flynn stated. Dressed in black. Good, with throwing knives. His hand gingerly touched his nose. And you? Jokal addressed the other guard. He rubbed the back of his neck. Mel, sir, I never saw nothing. I remember asking Flynn to get me something to eat, then nothing. Jokal snarled and glanced at Grendel. Do any of you do anything other than eat? He turned back to Flynn. Anything else? The guard shook his head. Jokal turned to Grendel. Are they telling the truth? What? How should I know? Grendel touched his chest. What do you want me to do, cast a spell to see if they're lying? Yes. Grendel glared at the king's lieutenant. Zuron told you, didn't he? King Zuron has told me a great deal about your abilities, sorcerer. Now, cast your spell. Mel shrank back. Wait, what are you doing? Something to hide? Jokal asked. No, no! The color drained from Mel's face. Will will it hurt? Grendel stepped forward, a smile on his face. You won't feel a thing. He closed his eyes, theatrically waved his hands in circles and figure eights, and mumbled an incantation. He heard the sharp intake of breath from everyone and resisted a smile. Simpletons. He snapped his eyes open, and thrust his open hands in Mel's direction. Za! Mel recoiled into the wall. His armor clanked. His head rebounded off the rough stone. 
Ouch, he cried, and rubbed the back of his head. You said it wouldn't hurt. The spell didn't, Grendel explained with a shrug. He turned to Jokal. They are telling the truth. You sure? His aura is a light blue. Grendel pointed at the guard. He has nothing to hide. And Flynn? What? Joe Cal, we've known each other since we were impressed into service. You don't trust me? I don't trust anyone, Joe Cal stated. Flynn pointed to Grendel. You trust him? I don't see no aura. An amused smirk twitched the corner of Joe Cal's mouth, and he glanced at Grendel. Are you lying, sorcerer? Grendel held out his arm. No, I have a blue aura as well. In fact, everyone here has a blue aura, except Flynn. His is black. Flynn stepped back, his face slack. B black? What does that mean? It means that you are angry that you are being questioned. It also means that you are telling the truth. He turned to Jokal. They never saw who attacked them. Jokal nodded. Everyone returned to their duties. He suspiciously eyed Grendel. The spell you cast, it covered everyone present? Grendel shrugged. That one, yes. I figured you would want everyone tested, so I cast it over everyone. Saves time. Then let's go upstairs and you can do it again. I want the servants and the rest of the guards checked. Of course. The quartet headed for the main levels, but were stopped short by a young squire. The boy, dressed in layered rags, ran to them, red-faced and panting. He sucked in a breath and spoke in a rush. Lord, Lord Jacal. Breath. The, the vault. Breath. The guard was knocked. Breath. Unconscious. Is he alive? The boy nodded, gulping air. And what of the dogs? Bribed, my lord. The boy stood up straight, his composure regained. Pieces of meat and bones. What was taken? Jokal's voice took on a hard edge. Guard Nix is checking now. Report back to him, squire. He patted the boy on the shoulder. Tell him I will be there shortly. Y yes my lord. The boy turned and sprinted away. Heads will roll for this. Jokal waved the quartet forward. They returned to the main levels of the castle and found the king slumped over, still asleep on his throne. The servants had carefully cleaned the plates on the dais and were turning their attention to the rest of the hall. Jokal snapped his fingers and everyone filed into the massive passage leading to the banquet room. Two guards slowly pulled the giant doors closed. Begin, sorcerer. Grendel again made a show of waving his hands and muttering his incantation. He enjoyed the theatrics, and it gave him an air of mystery. It also struck fear into anyone nearby. Everyone in the passage took a step back. Za! He learned to use incantations and potions as an apprentice for the great Malkov, the most famous sorcerer in the kingdom. Malkov taught him how to mix different herbs and plants to concoct potions. His mentor passed down knowledge on basic chemistry and the natural sciences, useful for explosions and other effects. The old wizard taught him a few magic tricks, mainly for defense. Magic is fleeting and always comes with a price, Malkov told him. Use it sparingly. More importantly, the old wizard taught him body language and how to read people. He did not cast a spell to elicit an aura around the people in the passage. He studied their body language when they thought a spell had been cast. He had never been wrong. Grendel took his time walking among the servants and knights. He looked each in the eye. Some shied away. Others stood defiant. He asked questions and watched their body language. None lied. The morning sun shone through the murder holes and windows. The bright beams brought welcome warmth before he finished reading the body language of the castle staff. No one saw anything, he concluded. Someone saw something, Jokal snarled. I'm going to find out what happened tonight, and when I do, heads will roll. My liege, Jokal said with a bow. King Zoran jumped, eyes wide. He grumbled under his breath, stroked his thin, wispy beard, and slowly focused on the four men standing before him. He grabbed a chalice in front of him and drank. He spit out the fluid. Anger colored his face. Water! Bring wine! A servant girl, dressed in a low-cut dress, appeared and poured a goblet full of red liquid. 
The king drank and held it out for a refill. The young woman complied, bowed, and backed away. Zuron drank again, licked his lips, and focused his attention on Jokal. What is it? We have interrogated everyone in the castle. No one saw anything. A few guards were knocked unconscious, but they did not see their attackers. We are continuing our search. The king blinked a few times and stared at Grendel. And what of you, warlock? No magic spell to find the intruders? No conjured spirit to tell you who attacked my castle? No, sire, Grendel blushed. I hate the word warlock. Jokal uncomfortably shuffled from one foot to another. There is more. The vault was breached. Zuron took another drink and stroked his gray-tinged beard again. His stare bore into Grendel's soul. Did I not instruct you to secure the vault? Grendel spoke before thinking. You instructed me to secure the emerald, not the vault. He winced, regretting the words. Anger tinged Juron's cheeks. Do not take that tone, warlock. Yes, sire. Were you not instructed to secure the vault and its contents? He slowly spoke each word. Yes, sire. Then why was your spell ineffective? I do not know, sire. Grendel audibly gulped. He had seen people, knights and syncophants, put to death for less. Jokal, sire, take this, this sorcerer to the vault. Have him do whatever it is he does. If he cannot find the interlopers, or if you are not satisfied with him... Zuron paused and took another drink. Then... Do away with him. There are other wizards in the kingdom. Jokal bowed. Yes, my liege. He grabbed Grendel's arm and did not let go when Grendel tried to break free. Let's go. He led Grendel and the two escorts from the great hall and down a stone corridor. Cook! Zuron's voice echoed. Where is my breakfast? The doors to the banquet hall closed, cutting off the rest of the king's tirade. The quartet marched through the musty passages. Sunlight spilled from open windows, providing little warmth against the breeze flowing through the open castle. Torches flickered. Servants moved out of their path. Whispered conversations stopped as they approached and resumed when they passed. A cold, anxious knot grew in Grendel's stomach. A pair of guards met them at the vault. Another man, a bandage on his nose, sat in the corner. Two dogs, tails wagging, happily gnawed on bones. Open it, Jokal ordered without preamble. One of the guards grabbed the handle, grunted, strained, and slowly pulled the thick oak door open on creaky, rusty hinges. The dogs looked up from their bones, and one let loose a single bark before they eagerly returned to their meals. Jokal addressed the bandaged man. Let me guess. You saw nothing? He shakily stood. A trickle of blood slipped from underneath the bandage and curved around his lips. He brushed it away. No, sir, heard a sound, saw a shadow, then nothing. And them? Jokal pointed to the dogs. The man shrugged. His armor clanked with the motion. Jokal smirked, dismissed them all with a wave, and entered the vault. Grendel followed. Anything missing? He stopped mid-stride, the answer before him. The vault contained treasures from past conquests, tributes from other lands, sculptures, paintings, and tapestries. Jewels filled cabinets and shelves on the right. One-of-a-kind golden chalices filled a case to his left. Grendel's eyes fell on a single pedestal, empty, in the center of the room. The king's emerald, the guard answered. Anger colored Jokal's cheeks. He whirled on Grendel. Do what you do, sorcerer, before the king has both our heads on a pike. He nodded, closed his eyes, and started his theatrics. He spun his hands in a circle and murmured under his breath. He pulled a dash of flash powder from beneath his tunic and flung it into the air. The chemicals mixed, flashed, and popped. Jokal and the other guards took a step back. Grendel stooped and studied the footprints on the floor. 
Several different boots mixed in the dirt. He spied a smaller set of prints and followed them around the room. They stopped before a bust of Zuron's father, Darxion, before moving on to the wall of golden chalices. The prince circumvented the vault before coming to rest before the empty pedestal. Smudged dirt dotted its surface. We are looking for a small man or a woman, Grendel stated. He stood to his full height and stretched. A woman? Jokal scoffed. You think a woman could come in here, take out my guards, open that door, he pointed to the heavy oak behind him, and steal the king's prize emerald? Yes. Ha! Jokal cried. His guards joined in the laughter. That is what my spell has shown me. Your spell is wrong, Jokal laughed. He grew serious. Or maybe you are misleading. Perhaps you know exactly where the emerald is because you took it. Grendel's eyes widened in shock. You must be joking. Why would I take this stone? Jokal stepped forward, his face a mask of seriousness. Everyone knows that you are unhappy in the king's employ, that you want to freelance. Perhaps you wanted to take something with you. Preposterous, so you say. Jokal continued, but you are the one saying that a woman entered the castle and stole the emerald. There is one more thing I can do. And what is that, sorcerer? A tracking spell, Grendel explained. I can track the emerald and the thief. Jokal thought for a moment. Then do so. But know this. If you fail, if this does not work, you will be burned at the stake before noon. Grendel gulped. Then I'd better get started. He sat cross-legged on the floor, closed his eyes, and thought back to the teachings of Malkov. Most of the old man's teachings were of science and reading people, but there were moments of magic, of touching other realms. Few people had the gift. Malkov was one. Grendel was another. The issue was energy. Entering the trance expended a great deal of energy and always left Grendel drained. He preferred using theatrics and science. He swore long ago to only use it as a last resort, like being threatened with burning at the stake. He relaxed and let his spirit fly. His body tingled as it flirted with magical realms. He felt a great release and saw himself flying over mid-city. The world was quiet and peaceful. No wind, no sound, no heat, and no cold. His spirit slid over the city like a wraith, following the emerald's path. The thief had traveled through a tunnel, across the rooftops, and through dark alleys. His vision homed in on a small shed near the city's walls. He focused on the lopsided structure, willing his spirit to see inside. The door creaked open, and a dark-garbed figure emerged from the dark interior. He stared at the face. Well? Jokal's voice intruded his concentration. A rough hand shook his shoulder. The visage disappeared. Grendel's spirit flew back across town and slammed into his body. He rolled backward, flat on the rough stone floor. He gasped for breath. His heart pounded. Sweat streamed down his forehead and stung his eyes. He shivered from the exertion. He slowly sat up, wiped his forehead, and opened his eyes. I had her! I had her! Grendel spat. Do not ever interrupt me when I do that. It's dangerous. What do you mean you had her? On the outskirts of the city, near the western gate, a small, broken building. She is there. Jokal's face blanched. Small building? Leaning to one side? Grendel sucked in a breath and nodded. Yes, you know it? Jokal hauled him to his feet. Grendel stood on shaky legs, and his body trembled from exhaustion from his spell. Come with me, sorcerer. Show me. And if you are lying, so help me. I'll light the fire myself. Grendel drained a second skin of water as he followed Jukal and the guards through Mid-City. His thirst rivaled the weakness in his body from the projection spell. He had only performed that particular feat twice before, and it took him hours to recover. He did not have hours. Jokal and the king wanted answers, now. The market square teemed with vendors and patrons, buying, selling, and trading. The cacophony of voices, 
Butcher knives slamming wood and crackling embers from cooking fires nearly deafened him. The thin haze of smoke in the area gave him a headache. The smell of cooking meat made his stomach growl. He had not eaten since being woken up hours earlier. He drained half of a third skin. Where is the shed? One of the guards behind him growled. The quartet rounded a corner and Grendel pointed. Jokal, in the lead of the formation, headed for the structure. You have been here before, Grendel observed. He drained the last of the skin and winced. Now he had to pee. Jokal stopped and turned around. What? You've been here before, Grendel repeated. You didn't see me point. You were ahead of me. You described the building in the vault. He tapped his chin. You know this place. Where is the emerald? He growled. Grendel slowly approached the leaning wooden structure. The guards unsheathed their swords behind him, and he flinched at the sound. He squatted and studied the myriad of boot prints around the shack. He saw a set of large prints and unconsciously glanced at Jokal about the same size. He turned to the ground before him. His eyes locked onto a small set, and he scooted forward. He touched the dirt, measured the print against the size of his hand, and nodded. Grendel stood. His hands and eyes plotted a path to the structure, and one away, heading down a nearby alley. That way. That way what? Jokal asked. He glared at Grendel. The woman went that way. What? Woman, Grendel sighed. The woman that stole the emerald. Jokal shook his head, and his eyes belied his disbelief. A woman. We went through this before. No woman took out a handful of guards and stole the king's emerald without being seen. This one did, Grendel answered, defiant. Remember what I said, sorcerer. If you are lying, I'll light the fire myself. Grendel waved him away with a hand, picked up the small footprint trail, and tracked it through the nearby alley. The tracks turned left toward the market. This way. The footprints trailed along the city wall, avoiding the market. He stopped and wiped the sweat from his forehead. The late morning sun beat down. Keep moving, Jokal grumbled. He too swiped at the perspiration streaming down his cheeks. I don't want to be out here all day. Yes, you want to burn me at the stake before noon he mused, but caught himself before he actually said the words. She stayed along the wall, he said aloud, probably to stay in the shadows. She is good. Jokal scoffed. The two guards said nothing. Grendel continued to the door to the Diamond in the Rough, a hotel and pub a few blocks from the market. The footprints scurried around the building. Grendel and his entourage followed. He stopped near the back door and squatted. These prints are fresh, no more than an hour old. You sure? Of course I'm sure, Jokal. Watch your tone, sorcerer. Grendel held up his hand for silence. The guards' hands went to their swords, but left them sheathed. Jokal stiffly stood and slowly looked around. Grendel searched the nearby shadows. We are being watched. I see nothing, Jokal snarled. He completed another search of the immediate area and snarled, Stop wasting my time. A flicker of movement drew Grendel's gaze to the deep shadow in a nearby alley. He concentrated, focusing his attention on the darkness. He raised his hand to shield the sun and squinted. The sun, slowly rising, illuminated the alley. The shadow melted. He unconsciously glanced at the sun and back to the alley. Another minute, he muttered. The sun hit its zenith, and the darkness disappeared from the alley. A pile of wooden crates sat in the center of the thoroughfare, but nothing else. Grendel ran forward and searched the alley floor. A pair of small footprints, well-defined in the soft dirt, filled the area beside the crates. They moved off down the alley. He stood and took two steps forward before the sun disappeared overhead, hidden by the building. This way, he said, waving his escort forward. He tracked the prince out of the alley and down a less-traveled side street. She is playing games, he murmured. What? Nothing. They traveled down the street, staying near the buildings. The footprints moved across the dirty avenue, only to return to the other side a few steps later. They continued through the city until the one-story buildings became two-story structures. The footprints stopped near the door to one of the buildings. Grendel called another halt, drank from another skin, and wiped his brow. He did not have to pee anymore. 
He gestured to the building. What is this place? The guards laughed. Jokal grinned. This? Grindel nodded. This is the local whorehouse. The guards laughed harder. Are you sure your woman went in there? <laughs> Maybe she's looking for a new career? One of his escorts wheezed. His partner put his hands on his knees, barely able to breathe from the laughter. Grendel stood upright, whirled, and searched the shadows. Someone watched him. Someone not amused by the guard's insinuations. I can feel it. Where? He studied the darkness between buildings. There, he pointed. He stood and sprinted toward the shadow of a nearby building. The laughter stopped. Hey! Clanking armor followed. She was here, Grendel exclaimed, breathing hard from his sudden run. He pointed at the small footprints on the ground. See? Jokal stared at the ground. I see a lot of boot prints, sorcerer. I'm growing tired of this. He stared Grendel in the eyes. Stop wasting my time. Grendel glared. I'm doing as you asked, Lord Jokal. The sarcastic Lord earned a flared nostril and a primitive bearing of teeth. The reaction satisfied Grendel, and he returned to studying the footprints on the ground. That way, he pointed toward another alley. He followed the trail without a glance at his escorts. How much longer are we going to put up with this? One of the escorts asked. Grendel recognized it as the same one who made a comment about a new career for the thief. Not much longer, Jokal assured him. I feel a huge bonfire in someone's future. The thought of being burned alive sent a shiver down Grendel's spine. He pushed the fear aside and concentrated on the trail. He followed it across Mid-City, visiting a dispensary, the livery, and the undertaker. Several times he felt eyes on him, but never saw the culprit. I'm getting nowhere, he thought. This thief is playing games with my life. Harsh voices cut through the late afternoon. He rounded a corner and stopped in his tracks. The trail had led them from the castle to the southernmost part of Mid-City, through the eastern side, back to the center, and then north to a second trade district. A crowd of people stood around the center stage. A handful of people, men mostly, huddled in the center of the stage, stripped to the waist. A man dressed in dull orange paraded back and forth, pointing and calling out numbers. A heavy hand clapped Grendel on the shoulder. Welcome to the slave market, Jokal cooed. Don't worry, you won't end up here, sorcerer. Your fate is decidedly warmer. I thought the king outlawed slavery. Jokal laughed. <laughs> he outlawed slavery for his people. These, he pointed toward the stage, are not of Zoran. You are. That's the reason you won't be sold into slavery, one of the guards added. Now that you've led us across this hot, miserable city, Jokal scowled. Where is the emerald? Grendel forced his eyes from the spectacle as the man in orange yelled, Sold! and pointed to a man in a blue hat. The crowd cheered. He turned his attention back to the dirt. That way, he said, pointing south. The quartet retraced their path toward the center of the city. They traveled dark alleys, crossed rutted streets, and entered the two-story ring of homes. The sun dipped lower on their right, and the buildings cast long shadows across the city. Boys sprinted up and down the dusty streets, lighting streetlights. The breeze picked up, cooling the sweat on Grendel's body. He put everything out of his mind and followed the footprints to the castle wall. They abruptly stopped. Well, Jokal asked, the trail stops here. Here? Grendel pointed to the wall. Right here. One of the guards edged forward. I've had enough of your games. Out here all day in this damnable sun, nothing to eat. His partner grabbed his shoulder, holding him back. You won't make it to be burned. Grendel shrank back in fear. His back hit the wall. Enough, Jokal ordered. He motioned for his men to fan out. The three armored men formed a rough semicircle. All of them scowled. The two guards, flanking Jokal, put their hands on the hilts of their swords. Grendel pushed against the wall, but had nowhere to go. The men slowly advanced. He saw murder in his escort's eyes. The shadow line from the setting sun eased up the castle wall, enveloping his body. He squinted against the light as the two guards quietly drew their swords. 
The shadow slid over his face, and Grendel had no choice. He sucked in a breath, readied himself, and began an incantation. His foot struck something solid, and he lost his train of thought. He looked down at the loose dirt. He nudged the dirt aside with his boot, the three men forgotten. A small object lay wrapped in cloth. Grendel dropped to his knees, dug in the dirt, and retrieved the item. He unwrapped it in the fading light. The king's emerald glowed in the twilight. Grendel breathed a sigh of relief as he held up the jewel. As promised, he said, and presented it to Jokal. Lord Jokal took the emerald and rolled it over in his fingers. Relief washed over his face. He slowly nodded. Well done, sorcerer, well done. Now, where is the thief? Grendel looked around him in the fading light. He saw his own footprints and nothing else. I, I don't know. All I see are my own tracks, and the light is almost gone. By morning the wind will have washed everything away. He looked Jokal in the eye. There is nothing else I can do tonight. Jokal pursed his lips and nodded again. You've done all you can. Yes, Grendel agreed. Arrest him, Jokal ordered. The two guards leapt forward and grabbed Grendel's arms before he could react. Grendel Tempest, you are under arrest for the theft of the king's emerald. What? No! I led you to it! You can't do this! I can. I will. I have, Jokal replied. How convenient that you led us to the jewel, but not the thief. I can only conclude that you are the thief. How else could you have known its whereabouts? I followed the trail, Grendel protested. You saw it! I saw a set of footprints and your eagerness to lead us about the city. King Zuron will decide your fate. Grendel sucked in a breath and started his incantation. The air around him vibrated and a tingle slid up his legs. Too close? I'll be affected too, he pressed on. The spell was his only hope. Jokal stepped forward, drew a dagger, and hit him in the head with the hilt. The blow broke his concentration. He saw stars. He lost the spell, and the tingling in his legs stopped. No more spells today, sorcerer. Jokal hit him again, and the world went black. Grendel slowly opened his eyes, winced, and quickly cinched them tight. The motion sent a shock wave through his body, and it felt like someone with a hammer beat his head from the inside. He gulped and tried to open his eyes again. The faded gray world focused, and he wished he still slept. He sat on a bench at one of the long tables in the banquet hall. A handful of guards surrounded him, a trio with swords drawn and pointed at his neck. Jokal stood to his right, a smug smile on his face. The king sat at the dais. It looked like he had not moved in more than a day. He wore a sour expression and crumbs. A young lady, barely out of her teens, sat next to him, a dreamy look on her face, as Merelda, the king's daughter. Ah, the warlock is awake. You hit him too hard, Lord Jokal, Zuron tisked. He picked up the green jewel from the table before him and casually studied the stone. A smile lifted the corners of his mouth. Beautiful, isn't it? One of the rarest of all gems in my kingdom. We have diamonds in the highlands and gold and silver in the Anor Mountains, but an emerald? A rare find indeed. He handed it to Esmeralda. Here, my dear. This was always destined to be yours. We are lucky that this, he snarled at Grendel, warlock did not get away with it. Esmeralda regarded Grendel with a mixture of pity and sadness. He met her gaze and saw something else. Longing. A tear slowly slid down her unblemished face. She reached over and touched the king's chair. Spare him, father, she pleaded. Make him my personal slave. Zuron patted her hand. No, my dear, he is too dangerous. A man of his skill and talents if he cannot be trusted, must be put to death. There is simply no other recourse. Father, please, I can make him— No, he stated. His voice remained level, 
but he put a touch of an edge in the tone. My decree is final. You will learn. As the future queen, you will have to make distasteful decisions. He pointed at Grendel. This is one of those. Go, my dear, I wish to shield you from what is about to transpire. There will be time for that when you are older. Father, I... No, Zoran firmly insisted. Go. Take the emerald back to the vault. Esmeralda bowed her head. Yes, father. She kissed his cheek, cast one last look at Grendel, and made her way from the banquet hall. A pair of guards and a trio of maidens fell in behind her before the door closed. You performed your tasks admirably, warlock. He sadly shook his head. But I cannot forgive thievery. Sire, if I may, Grendel asked. King Zoran suspiciously eyed him for a handful of heartbeats. He nodded, but raised a finger in caution. If you try to cast a spell, those men will kill you where you stand. Speak. Grendel rose to his feet. The trio of swords moved with him, almost touching his neck on three sides. Bide your time, not now, he admonished himself. He cleared his throat. Sire, I have always been loyal. That has not changed. Contrary to what Lord Jokal has told you, I did not steal the emerald. Zoran laughed. Jokal has sung your praises, warlock. He laughed harder at Grendel's shocked expression, caught his breath, and took a drink from his goblet. <laughs> I see that you did not expect that. To be honest, neither did I. But Jokal has been the best advocate in your defense. Grendel turned and stared. I thought you hated me. Jokal grinned. No, sorcerer, I do not hate you. I think you are a charlatan, a con man who has beguiled the king and others for many years. You are also a master storyteller, a master of sleight of hand. That is how you have convinced so many of your, he smirked, magic. But I do not hate you. Grendel gulped and turned back to the king. That is singing my praises? Others have said far worse. What? What others? Zoran laughed again. Do you really think that matters now, with your death hours away? I guess not, Grendel admitted. But I do get to say something in my defense. The king swept his hand to encompass the room. The floor is yours. Grendel paused a moment and gathered his thoughts. The touch of cold steel at his neck served as a reminder not to try a spell. His trembling knees told everyone that he was too frightened to try anything. He cleared his throat, gulped, and began. I was asleep when the emerald was stolen. I'm sure the guards in the hall outside of my room can attest to that. Those guards were rendered unconscious during the intrusion, Zoran countered. An amused smile lifted the corners of his mouth. Do continue. I was awakened from slumber by Jokal. He saw me in my quarters. Jokal shrugged and offered a nod to the king. He said nothing. I assisted in the interrogation of the unconscious guards. How convenient, Juron mused. Go on. I found the emerald as you directed. Yes, Zoran agreed. He took another drink, grabbed a cold turkey leg from a plate, and took a bite. He noisily munched for a moment around a big smile. Let's... He gulped down the morsel. Let's discuss that. You discovered my escape route underneath the city. How? Escape route? The leaning shack, Jokal explained. There is a tunnel that leads from the castle to that shack. It is only used in emergencies and when someone wants to get out without attracting attention. Grendel snapped his fingers. That's it! Three swords touched his neck, and he froze. The king waved off the guards, and the swords withdrew. That's it, sire. The thief followed someone from the city into the tunnel. That would explain the footprints leading to and from the shack. Ah, our mysterious woman thief. Zuron barely restrained his laughter. She followed someone through the tunnel, 
fought nearly a dozen guards and two dogs. What? Yes, thank you, Lord Jokal. And two dogs broke into my vault, stole the jewel, and left my castle without being seen. Does that sum it up? Yes, sire. And then she led you on a wild hog chase across Mid-City, Zoran laughed. <laughs> Tell me, warlock, what was your favorite destination? The diamond in the rough? I've never been there, but I hear the ale is without comparison. Perhaps the slave market? Jokal said that took your breath away. He caught his breath, took another bite of the turkey leg, and chomped the meat. I know. He gulped the food down. <sighs> the whorehouse. That was your favorite. <laughs> a stew, I'm sure. <laughs> he laughed himself into a coughing fit. He hunched over, dropped the turkey leg on the table, and spilled his goblet. Zoran coughed until he vomited the turkey onto the floor. The fit subsided. The red-faced king stared at the mess he made and slid one chair to his left. Drink, he called. The server girl entered, a jug of wine in her hand. She stopped two steps into the banquet hall, eyes wide at the mess on the floor. Zuron picked up another goblet and banged it on the table. The girl hurriedly filled the goblet, let him drain it, and refilled it again. She bowed and backed away. She cast a final glance at the mess on the floor before disappearing back toward the kitchen. Zuron composed himself, took another sip, and stared at Grendel. Where was I? The whorehouse, my king. He almost broke into another fit of laughter but stopped himself. I haven't been there in decades, Lord Jokal. He grinned. Perhaps I should visit my subjects? As you wish, my leash. So... Warlock, the mysterious thief led you and Lord Jokal on a tour of the city, which just happened to end up back at my castle, where you happened to find my emerald. Is that a fair assessment? Grendel gulped. The story was accurate, but the king's tone told him to abandon all hope. A cold shiver touched his spine, and he lowered his head in resignation. Yes, sire, that is accurate. Do you concur, Lord Jokal? Yes, my liege. As I said, he is a master storyteller. If I were a playwright, I could do no better. Zuron licked his lips and laughed. <laughs> Perhaps you should have been a playwright instead of a magician. He took another drink, reached for the discarded turkey leg, thought better of it, and sat back in his new seat. Do you have anything else to add before I pronounce judgment? I did not steal the emerald, sire. The sad thing is, warlock, I believe you. A surge of hope flooded Grendel. But the evidence presented today by your own testimony has tied my hands. My testimony? But, but I've said nothing. I've only agreed with your account of events. Exactly, Zoran grinned. Grendel Tempest, you have been found guilty of theft from the king. The sentence is death, to be carried out tomorrow at noon. May the gods receive you well. Part 3. Escape I didn't steal the emerald. Grendel Tempest struggled against the two guards that escorted him across a courtyard outside of the castle. The two men, each dwarfing the sorcerer by more than a foot, picked him up by his elbows and carried him. Grendel helplessly kicked the air. Put me down! I didn't steal anything! The bright midday sun beat down on him. Sweat poured from his forehead. They carried him along the road, amidst a gathering crowd, toward a small wooden platform. A single pole had been erected, ringed by piles of wood and straw. Ropes, tied to four nearby buildings, formed an X in the plaza and centered the pole. Grendel saw the makeshift structure and stopped struggling. 
I didn't do anything, he squeaked. Rough hands lifted him onto a small wooden platform and tied his hands around the pole at his back. One of them looked at Grendel and winked. The other lightly thumped him in the chest. They jumped down, laughed, and replaced a couple of logs they had moved. The pair headed back toward the castle. Shouts and jeers crushed him from all sides. Throngs of citizens had gathered outside the castle and formed a large circle around the soon-to-be bonfire. Behind them, armored knights and guards formed an enormous horseshoe. The king and his entourage exited the castle and took their position in the open section of the large semicircle. Zoran sat on a large portable throne, a drink in his hand, and cheerily waved to the crowd. They roared in response. Esmeralda stood beside her father, sadness in her eyes. A tear slowly trailed down a rouge-colored cheek. She turned and said something to her father that Grendel could not hear. King Zoran emphatically shook his head no. The crowd chanted, Burn him! Burn him! The world crashed in around Grendel. He closed his eyes and remembered every lesson that Malkov taught him, every spell, every potion. Nothing came to his panicked mind. He could track a deer through the forest, levitate a piece of fruit, and cast his body out into the world. But he had nothing to unwind a simple knot. You should have studied more, his consciousness smirked. Zoran held up his hands, and the crowd quieted. Mid-City paused, waiting for the official proclamation. Even the wind and the blowing dust seemed to pause, as if the gods themselves held their breaths. Lord Jokal stepped forward, cleared his throat, and let his voice carry across the gathered throng. Grendel Tempest, sorcerer, magician, warlock, you have been found guilty of stealing from His Majesty King Zoran. The penalty for such a crime is death. Do you have any final words? The onlookers turned their attention to the bonfire. Grendel wished he could wipe the sweat from his brow. Salty perspiration trailed down his face and stung his eyes. He rapidly blinked the liquid away and gulped the bile threatening to cascade from his body. The anticipatory stares from the citizens of Mid-City did not help his mental state. I did not steal from the king. The crowd looked to Jokal like they watched a barrage of arrows streak between warring armies. No one said a word. Lord Jokal glanced over his shoulder at King Zoran, who barely suppressed a smile. His lips twitched. He took a drink. Esmeralda leaned over again, and Grendel heard a snippet. Please, father, let him watch him personally. Zoran again shook his head and motioned for his trusty lieutenant to continue. The king does not share your profession of innocence, Jokal stated. Did I hear you correctly? Are you saying that his majesty is lying? The trap had been sprung. The crowd, holding their collective breaths, looked back to Grendel. He sighed and resigned himself to his fate. He was dead either way now. There was only one more play. No, Lord Jokal, I'm not calling the king a liar. I... Then you are guilty? I believe he may have been misled. He carefully chose his words. Someone gave him false information. The crowd returned their gaze to the king and his entourage. Jokal snickered. And who might that be? The crowd pivoted. You, Lord Jokal. A gasp echoed through those gathered. Knights and guards shifted, their armor clanking in the silence. Jokal's jaw hung open. The gods released their breath, and a warm breeze stirred the dust in mid-city. King Zoran laughed. <laughs> well played, warlock, he guffawed. Well played. He addressed his lieutenant with a smile. Lord Jokal, did you provide your king with false information? Jokal bowed. No, my liege. Zuron smirked. Well, I'm satisfied. The gathered crowd cheered. Lord Jokal, carry out my sentence. Yes, my liege. Jokal turned again to face Grendel. As decreed by King Zuron, you are to be burned at the stake. May the gods have mercy on your soul. He stepped over to a knight holding a burning torch, took the flame, and slowly made his way toward the bonfire. He raised his arms, and the crowd roared. 
Burn him! Burn him! They chanted. Jokal stopped a few feet from the platform. He turned a slow circle, the torch held high, and ensured he had the crowd's attention. He lowered his hands, and the roar diminished. He turned to Grendel. I told you, sorcerer, that I would personally light the fire. The citizens nearest the bonfire roared in laughter. The words were passed along, and the laughter spread like waves in a lake. Jokal lowered the torch and quickly raised it. Any last words? Jokal taunted. He motioned with the torch again. Anger and emotion swelled within him, fear of death, anger at being falsely accused, and hatred for the betrayal from a man he thought a friend. Defiance won the day, and Grendel snarled. If you're going to do it, then do it. Your smug smile is boring me. The crowd laughed. Jokal stepped back, slack-jawed at the insult. He licked his lips, held out the torch, and theatrically opened his hand. The fiery stick dropped from his grasp and landed in the straw around the platform. The fire caught immediately, spread, and soon the entire circle of straw blazed. It caught the wooden logs and slowly crept upward toward Grendel. Lord Jokal turned and walked away without a glance. The heat rose around Grendel. The air grew thick and heavy with smoke. He closed his eyes and tried again to think of a spell or incantation that could save him. The crackling flames grew louder, breaking his concentration. Fire nipped at his feet, and he shifted a step around the pole. Intense heat stalled his escape. His trousers caught fire. Grendel screamed. The crowd roared. Esmeralda cried. King Zoran smiled and drank. Good riddance, muttered Jokal. A flash of silver arched across the courtyard and embedded deep in the pole. It nicked the ropes, but did not cut them. A second knife followed and neatly cut Grendel's bonds. He pulled his hands around, patted out his trousers, and looked for a way out. Fire surrounded him, growing in intensity. The heat sucked the air from his lungs. Everyone in the plaza searched for the source of the daggers. There! someone cried and pointed to a nearby three-story home. Every eye turned in that direction. A small woman dressed in gray and black stood on the roof. Her right hand rested on one of the ropes that stretched across the courtyard. She looped a leather strap over the rope, grasped both ends in her left hand, and stepped from the roof. The crowd gasped. She dangled from the rope as she slid across the courtyard. She made eye contact with Grendel and motioned for him to move to his right. He looked at the flames and back to her. He shook his head. The woman, picking up speed, pointed again. Grendel shuffled to the side, but the heat pushed him back. He shook his head again. Damn it! the woman yelled. She adjusted position beneath the rope, spread her right arm wide, and let go of the leather strap a few feet from where the rope ended at the top of the pole. She crashed into Grendel. The impact knocked him backward, pushed the air from his lungs, and sent him sprawling. She wrapped her arms around him as they flew through the flames. He started to scream again, but the intense heat vanished in an instant, and they rolled across the dirt courtyard. The crowd parted, running, tripping, and falling around them. The crowd created a barrier between them and the guards. He lay there, out of breath and amazed to be alive. He started to thank long-forgotten gods when the woman hauled him to his feet. She stood a half-foot shorter than he, with dark hair, penetrating blue eyes, and a scowl on her lips. That way, she ordered, and pushed him away from the bonfire. Move! But move! An arrow flashed through the air. Grendel headed in the direction she indicated. A pair of guards stepped in front of him, and he slowed. The woman sped past him, kicked one guard in the chest, and punched the other in the chin. Her hands and feet moved so fast that Grendel could not follow the motion. The armored guards fell, and the woman continued on her path. He followed. More arrows flew. Most missed, striking the stone walls of the wooden houses. A few landed in the crowd. Screams echoed in the midday sun. The citizens scattered, adding to the pandemonium. Zuron and Jokal yelled contradicting orders to the guards. The armored men stood, unsure of what to do. Grendel followed the woman through a dark alley, turned right down another dirt street, and left into another alley. They emerged near the livery. She stopped, pushed him to the shadow of the corral, and sucked in deep breaths. Pain. Pain lashed up through Grendel's legs. His rapid heartbeat threatened to blow an eardrum. 
He looked down and burns blistered his legs. His eyes widened in fear and the pain doubled. It's okay, the woman said, her voice calm despite the heroics. It'll be a while before they can mount a search party. Her eyes followed his gaze to his leg. She pulled a small vial of something from a pouch at her belt. Put some of this on it. It won't do anything for the pain, but it will help you heal. Grendel took the medicine, cracked open the top, and sniffed. He gagged. You want me to put this there? He pointed. Yes, and quickly. Who are you? He smeared the salve on his burns. Pain streaked through his legs. He winced and almost cried out. The agony subsided, leaving him with a dull, painful ache. He glared at her, but put more of the cream on his wounds. He clenched his teeth against the pain. My name is Kara, she said with a smile, and I must apologize for getting you into this mess. You got me into this? Grendel glared. You're the thief? I prefer rogue, she replied, thinking about Jacob's use of the word and the fear in his voice. She held up her hand and held off his response. Shouts and footfalls echoed through the narrow alleys. They'll be organized soon. We need to keep moving. She paused. You're Grendel? He nodded. The king's sorcerer. Warlock. Warlock? Kara nodded. I like the sound of that. Well, come on, warlock. Let's get the hell out of here. Kara took the lead and led him through alley after alley, traveling to the north side of Mid-City. Behind them, alarms, shouts, and screams moved like a wave through the town. They passed the Undertaker, where Jacob brought the dead marauders. A thin, wispy man with gaunt eyes and pale skin supervised three others as they built wooden coffins. He watched the pair dash between alleys, and Kara saw him automatically hold his hand up to his neck, measuring her height. She raised an eyebrow and nodded at his close estimation. She pushed on. Where are we going? Grendel gasped. Sweat glistened on his forehead and left streaks in the dirt on his face. He staggered a minute, caught himself on a wooden building, and plunged ahead, staying on her heels. North side near the gate, Kara replied. She glanced behind her, saw the condition of her new ward, and slowed. They crossed another street, slipped into the deep shadow of an alley, and stopped. Grendel collapsed in a heap at her feet. She pulled a skin of water and passed it to the older man. Here. Thank you. He managed, took a few breaths to calm down, and drank half the skin. He handed it back. His stomach rumbled. He still had not eaten since he woke the day before. You okay? No, he said, shaking his head. I feel like I traveled the entire city yesterday, then a restless night, followed by almost being burned at the stake, and now this? I don't know how much more I can take. It appears that I am the cause of much of your pain, Kara stated. I am truly sorry about that. It was never my intent to involve you. I simply needed a diversion. A diversion? A diversion? You almost got me killed yesterday. And today! A smile lifted the corners of her mouth. Well, I will tell you, Warlock, watching you and Lord Arrogant traipse around the city yesterday was very entertaining. Grendel stared at her for a moment, then burst laughing. Lord Arrogant? A good name for Jokal. He never liked me, despite what he told Zuron. He thought I was a rival for the hand of Princess Esmeralda. Were you? Kara asked and took a drink from the skin. No. She was, unfortunately, infatuated with me, and he took that as a mutual attraction. Grendel reached for the skin, took it, and drained it. He loudly gulped the last of the water and licked his lips. He took her affection for me as an obstacle for his own lust, for her and the throne. Mark my words, he wishes to be king one day. Kara did not doubt the words. I am sorry. I thought that once they found the emerald that you would be beyond reproach. Yeah, well, that did not work, did it? He lowered his sweaty head into his hands. My reputation is ruined. Even if we live, I'll never work for the king, any king, again. He looked at her with painful, sad eyes. I may never be able to find reputable work again. I never had much use for reputable employment, Kara admitted. Never suited me. She placed the empty skin in a pouch at her waist. Are you ready to continue? It will be dark in a few hours, and we need to be in position to leave the gate. And go where? 
he asked, crawling to his feet. He winced in pain, bent forward, and massaged his thighs and calves, careful to avoid the burns. I hear the highlands are beautiful. They are, Grendel agreed with a nod. They are also filled with the king's supporters. You have another place in mind? He sighed, a deep sound of resignation that perked Kara's senses. The Badlands. She smirked. You want to go to the Badlands? Of course not, he barked. He glanced up and down the alley and lowered his voice. Of course not. But that is the one place Zuron has no loyalists and is unwilling to go. Any place else will lead to being burned to death. He shivered. I've heard the Badlands are dangerous? Yes, very much so, he stated. But at least there, death will be quick. I like the way you think, Kara smiled. She unconsciously touched all of her weapons. Then let's head toward the eastern gate. I'll steal a few horses and we'll be on our way. You make it sound simple. It is, if they'll cooperate. She flashed a toothy smile. Grendel grabbed her arm. One thing I'm curious about. Yes? Why take the emerald only to return it? Diversions, my dear Grendel, diversions. Diversions? he asked, confused. Her smile grew. While the king concentrated on the emerald, no one looked to see what else might have been taken. What else? Grendel's eyes widened. What else? What else did you take? Something much more valuable than a single gemstone. She patted the satchel at her side and smiled. Let's get out of here. We can divvy up the spoils later. She led him back down the alley, across the street, and into another dark passage. They bypassed a foot patrol of four armored guards, slipped past a second patrol on horseback, and headed east. The sun, at their backs, slowly inched toward the western horizon. Two dusty streets over, they paused to let a foot patrol pass. The six men darted into the alley, looked directly at them, and moved along without spotting them in the shadows. Kara counted to ten and led Grendel across another dirt avenue and into another dark alley. Kara peeked out and quickly pulled her head back. A wry smile touched her lips. Good news and bad. Which do you want first? Grendel gulped in air. He ached from two days of movement. I'm a wizard, not a warrior. I'm not meant for this. Bad. There's an entire phalanx of guards around the corner. A chill coursed down his spine. The good? The gate is right behind them. How do you propose to get around an entire phalanx? He hissed and licked his dry lips. He wanted another skin, but knew they had none. We wait until night, she proposed, and slink right past them. They'll never know we were even here. You there! A voice tore through the late afternoon. The challenge echoed across the buildings. Step out! Grendel's eyes widened at a guard. The man stared into the alley and pointed right at Kara. He slunk deeper into the shadow. Don't play games, little girl, the guard bellowed. The lead element of the phalanx, twenty men, turned their attention to the alley. I see you. Step out, now. What now? Grendel whispered in a panic-tinged scree. Well? She smiled and drew her daggers. Now we fight. She threw him a side glance and frowned. He imagined what she saw. A man, nearly double her age, cowering behind her, eyes wide in fear. He glanced at his trembling hands. If you've got a spell or two, she continued, now's the time. She winked, stood, and stepped into the street. Sunlight glinted off the blades in her hands. Drop the weapons, the guard cried. Come and take them, Kara challenged. She twirled the daggers in her hands. The forward edge of the phalanx took a step in her direction. Kara vanished in a puff of smoke. The guards froze. The men looked up and down the street trying to find her. Grendel's eyes widened. He saw what the rogue did, and the audacity stunned him. Kara dropped a small pouch, no bigger than a plum, at her feet. The cloth sack hit the ground and exploded in a flash of light and a gush of smoke. She turned and ran past Grendel deeper into the alley's shadows. She rounded the corner to her left and disappeared down the street behind him. The entire thing happened in the span of four heartbeats. Grendel, stunned, sat unmoved. Find her, the lead guard ordered. Find her now! He peered into the dark alley and started moving in Grendel's direction. 
He trembled and gulped against a dry throat. Panic raged in his mind. What do I do? What do I do? He's going to see me. Protect yourself. A calm voice edged through the chaos. Protect? Grendel's mind instantly calmed, and he muttered a protection spell. Adrenaline surged, making up for his low energy level. He touched the magic realm and pulled a cloak across his body. The guard walked right past. He turned, scratched his nose, and returned to the mouth of the alley. Disperse! I told you to find the girl! Find her! The phalanx dispersed, fanning out to search the side streets and alleys. Grendel breathed a sigh of relief and dropped the cloak. Neat trick, Kara whispered in his ear. He jumped, and a sharp yelp escaped his lips. The guard turned back to the alley with squinted eyes and a frown. Shh, Kara cautioned. You have any more tricks up your sleeve, warlock? A few, Grendel replied with a nod. His whole body trembled, and he did not know if it was from fear or the expense of energy. Well, get ready to use them. She pulled another small cloth bundle from her pouch and hurled it behind the lead guard. It hit with a loud pop. The guard turned. Kara moved. She took a half-dozen steps, leaped into the air, and landed on the man's back. She brought the hilts of the daggers down on his neck and rode him to the ground. He lay in the middle of the street, unconscious. Get her! A trio of men yelled. They left their position by the gate and charged across the dusty street. Onlookers, pushed into their homes after Grendel's escape less than an hour earlier, returned to the avenue. They cried and chanted, their voices mixed and blended, and Grendel had no idea if the citizens pulled for the guards or the young woman standing alone in the street. He reached into the magic realm again, focused the adrenaline coursing through his veins, something Malkove told him never to do, and dropped one of the guards with an incapacitation spell. The man keeled over and dropped to the street in a plume of dust. His companions paused. Kara moved. She launched herself at the nearest man and smacked him in the face with the hilt of her dagger. He screamed, dropped his sword, and reached for his broken nose. She grabbed his hand and hit him again, using his armor against him. His eyes rolled into the back of his head, and he fell over like a tree in the forest. She let him fall and headed for the last of the three. He turned to run. She launched a dagger in his direction and caught him in the nape of the neck. He sprawled in the dirt. The gathered crowd cheered. Grendel stepped out of the alley, shoulders drooped. He leaned against a wall and watched Kara retrieve her thrown dagger. She picked up a dropped sword, twirled it to the joy of the citizens, smirked, and dropped it. She returned to Grendel's side. You okay? she asked. Fine, he muttered. Can we get out of here before more come? She cocked her head. Too late. I hope you have a few more tricks. Her smile faded. The phalanx is returning. The phal- the entire phalanx? Sounds like, she said, and pushed him back into the shadows of the alley. I'm trying not to kill these guys. They're just doing their jobs. But if you don't have something nasty in your magical repertoire, then I will have to spill blood. Grendel deeply inhaled and slowly let out the breath. He repeated it and calmed his mind and body. Distract them for a couple of minutes. I can get us out of here without bloodshed. But... His voice trailed off. But what? There will be a cost. If you don't do it, it'll cost us our lives. Grendel stared into the young woman's blue eyes. He saw strength, courage, humor, and honor. Strange to see in a thief. He nodded. Buy me a few minutes. He sat down, cross-legged, and slowly calmed his spirit. Kara glanced over her shoulder, down the road at the gathering troops, and back. In the distance, armor clanked and booted feet pounded the earth. The crowd cheered. A trumpet blared. Her smile returned. That I can do. She turned and sprinted out of the alley, directly toward the eastern gate. Grendel closed his eyes and stretched out to the magic realm. Every precautionary tale told by Malkov cascaded through his memories. He pushed them all aside and concentrated. More than fifty men approached, and it would take every trick he ever learned for them to survive. Grendel's eyes bulged at the chaos before him. His mouth hung open. The crowd filling the street quieted in stunned silence. The rogue waded into the approaching guards like a blade scything wheat. 
Kara moved in a blur. She ducked under a blade and punched the guard in the groin. She rolled to her right and swept the legs out of another. She jumped to her feet and charged a third. She sidestepped a downward swipe of a sword, leapt onto the man's shoulders, and somersaulted onto a fourth. She left a pile of downed men in her wake. The crowd cheered again. A whip cracked. Kara spun away from a guard with a red plume on his helmet. He cracked the leather strap again, barely missing her. She dove, rolled, and came up under another guard. A swift kick in the nethers sent him staggering back into another pair of armored guards. They fell together in the path of a third whip strike. They yelped in pain as the leather found its mark. Kara glanced back into the alley. A little help here! She moved again, dodged a sword thrust, and spun inside the sword's reach. She elbowed the man twice in the nose and ran. Grendel closed his eyes, shut out the cheering crowd, and concentrated on the spell he needed. Something whistled past his head, and he opened his eyes. A crossbow bolt vibrated in the wall next to his head. He gulped and stared at the melee. An armored man hastily reloaded his crossbow thirty yards away. Maledictus somo, Grendel said, and thrust his outstretched hand at the man. The sleep spell was quick and barely used any energy, but it had the desired effect. The archer slumped over unconscious. Two more archers stepped behind their fallen comrade and aimed their crossbows. Ventus vere! A gust of wind snagged the two and lifted them off the ground. They fired. The maelstrom sent the arrows in different directions. Two guards screamed when the bolts found their mark. The wind spring hurled the two archers into their comrades. Grendel's energy dropped. He put his hands on his knees and sucked in a deep breath. Too much activity, not enough food. He looked at Kara, sweat glistening on her pale skin as she bounced, dodged, and leapt in constant motion. A man with a crossbow aimed at her back. Capitus! The man dropped his weapon, grabbed his head, and fell to his knees. He screamed, distracting the men around him. Two rushed to his aid as he rolled on the ground in agony. Maledictus Somo! The two new arrivals fell beside the man, all three asleep. Kara slowed. She threw a pale powder at two men. They dropped their swords and grabbed their faces, blind. They bumped into their comrades, disrupting their attack. She backpedaled away from the melee, put her hands on her hips, and deeply inhaled. A line of ten men formed before her. Grendel closed his eyes. Tempestus Anamatha. He waved his hands before him and thrust them toward the men. They levitated, raised by an invisible hand. The wind howled and hurled them fifty feet across the dusty street. They landed, rolled, and lay still. The crowd gasped and stepped back. Kara turned to him and winked. A smile lit her face. I like these odds much better, she called. Another set of guards, twenty, rounded a distant corner at the march. Their footfalls echoed in unison, reverberating off the wooden buildings and shaking the ground. Her smile faded. Well, I did. You got any more tricks up your sleeve? Grendel nodded. He closed his eyes. Vivifica, he muttered. Revive, give me strength. Cautionary words flowed through his mind. Malko's voice haunted his memories. There is always a price for magic. Sometimes it is energy. Your very life force. Sometimes it's much deeper, darker. Use it sparingly, and never use it on yourself. Energy coursed through his body. Electric currents flowed across his skin. His hair and scalp tingled. A discharge built within him. His eyes flashed open. Onyx orbs stared at nothing. Nesciendus undam he said, his voice deep and foreboding. He waved his hand toward the charging soldiers. Every armored guard on the street stopped, staggered, and collapsed. A few elicited a gasp. Most silently fell. Plumes of dust and dirt filled the air. Grendel slumped against the building and slowly slid down the wall. His legs trembled. His knees buckled. Every ounce of energy left him. The world faded into a pinprick of light in a vast tunnel. He slipped toward unconsciousness. Whoa, Kara said, helping him to the ground. You okay? T tired. What did you do? She asked. Are they dead? 
he forced his eyes open and stared at her. His normal brown eyes replaced the supernatural black onyx. Sleep. Spell, he slurred. His head drooped to one side. He wanted to sleep. Stay here, she said. Her hands disappeared from his shoulders. He tried to open his eyes, but his eyelids weighed a ton. The silence of the street welcomed him. He jerked awake, adrenaline surging. He stared at the street. The people? Did I put them to sleep? The citizens of Mid-City stood in stunned silence, staring at the guards that littered the street. One by one, they turned their gaze to Grendel. Shock filled their faces. Some prayed while others stayed back. A few slowly ventured forward. He closed his eyes and welcomed sleep. Kara returned with two horses in tow. She looped the reins to a nearby cart and knelt at his side. Cool water touched his lips. He slowly sipped, then eagerly gulped the liquid. He opened his eyes. Thank you. You saved us both, she pointed to the horses. Can you ride? We need to get out of here. I don't think either of us has the energy to do that again. Grendel nodded, and Kara helped him to his feet. Two men, concern etched on their faces, stepped forward and helped him into the saddle. They warily watched the pair, but said nothing. A woman followed and offered Kara a satchel filled with fruits and vegetables. She passed along a pair of blankets as well. Kara thanked her and climbed into the saddle. Conversation again filtered through the assembled throng. The talk turned into cheers as Kara and Grendel headed toward the eastern gate. The pair left mid-city as the sun slowly sank toward the western horizon. Grendel awoke with a start. Stars filled the night sky and a half-moon lit the landscape. A fire crackled nearby. One side of his body was warm, the other chilled. He sat up and stretched. His body ached every inch of his body. He softly moaned. Evening, about time you woke up. Kara sat cross-legged on the opposite side of the fire. The flickering flames lit her face in constantly changing light. An array of daggers lay before her, glistening in the firelight. How long, he croaked, his mouth as dry as a desert. A few hours, she replied, and tossed a skin of water. Grendel eagerly drank, loudly gulped, belched, and wiped his mouth with a sleeve. Where, he cleared his throat, <clears throat> where are we? The foothills of the Anur Mountains, she answered. Here, she said, and underhanded an apple to him. Eat, I'm sure you're starving. The rest will be ready shortly. The rest? Kara pointed toward the fire, and Grendel noticed an animal on a spit. She rotated the soon-to-be dinner a half-turn. That was quite a display you put on back there, she said. Thank you for saving us. Grendel stared at the fire, mesmerized by the flame. I didn't do it for you. I know. I did it because you left me no choice, he continued. I'm in this predicament because of you. I said I was sorry for getting you involved, she sighed. It was supposed to be in and out, only a few unconscious guards in my wake. Something else set off the search. What? Grendel looked away from the fire and stared at her. What are you talking about? She smirked and pulled the animal from the fire. She gingerly removed the hot meat from the spit, walked over, and sat beside Grendel. She produced another dagger from her belt, sliced off a piece of meat, and popped it in her mouth. She frowned and shrugged, but chewed the unseasoned meal. I've been in castles before, she explained. In and out, a ghost. Something raised the alarm, and they went straight to you. Why? Grendel shrugged and tasted the meat. It burned his tongue. He blew on it and tried again. Better. He chewed and thought about her question. I was supposed to protect the jewel. The king hired me to put a tracking spell on it in case someone did try to steal it. She smirked. That must be it. No. No? No, Grendel said with a smile. There is no tracking spell. Never was. It's not possible. Well, at least it's not in my repertoire. How did you track it? She asked, curiosity filling her voice. My mentor taught me many tricks, including how to track. I simply followed your footsteps. Kara laughed. Then I have a mystery to solve. We, Grendel chewed on another morsel. We 
have a mystery to solve. I'm not sure you're up to this, warlock. You got me into this, rogue. You owe me. Twice now. Twice? One for getting me dismissed from the king's court, and one for saving your life. I believe I saved your life first. Grendel stared into the fire and thought of the flames licking at his feet. He shivered. You still owe me. I guess I do, she admitted. She passed him another piece of meat. For what it's worth, I am sorry. Grendel took the meat and tore off a chunk with his teeth. He smiled as he chewed. It's all right. I was tired of working for Zuron anyway. He gulped down the bite. So, what do we do next? Kara stood and returned to the opposite side of the fire. She slowly and methodically replaced the blades to her belt, her boots, and hidden scabbards in her clothes. First, we get a good night's sleep. I think we both need it. Grendel nodded in agreement. And then? She stretched out on a small blanket. Then we find out what is really going on. Good night, Grendel. He stretched out on his own blanket and stared at the stars. Good night, Kara. He closed his eyes and let his weary body rest. He had no idea what the morrow would bring, but he felt sure he would not like it. With a face for radio and a voice for silent movies, writing was his only recourse. R. Kyle Hanna is a self-professed geek and lover of most things sci-fi. He began writing in high school as an outlet for an overactive imagination. Those humble beginnings, combined with real-life experiences from a 29-year career in the Army, have spawned a dozen full-length adventures and numerous short stories. His 2019 release, Harvest Day, won Best Sci-Fi Novel at the 2000 Imagine Awards. He was named one of the 50 great writers you should be reading by the Authors Show in 2016. He is also the winner of two Pinnacle Book Awards for Time Assassins and the Jake Cutter Conspiracy. Reminiscent of Arthur C. Clarke is how Writer's Digest describes his first novel, To Aid and Protect. He is a founder and vice president of Jumpmaster Press. See JumpmasterPress.com. He lives in the suburbs of Birmingham, Alabama, with his wife, children, and two dogs. Follow him on Facebook at Arkyle Hanna Writer, on X at Arkyle Hanna, and Instagram at Arkyle Hanna. This has been a Jumpmaster Press production of Rogues and Warlocks, The King's Emerald, by Arkyle Hanna. Read by Rick McVeigh. Printing and production copyright 2023 by Jumpmaster Press.